The KN Large Luxury SUV was the car that turned around Porsche's fortunes, and it's a car that still manages to set standards in its segment in this third generation form. It's smarter, faster, more efficient and impressively advanced, while a plug-in hybrid version and efficiency improvements across the range claim to keep the green lobby at bay. Best of all, it can reward you at the wheel in a way that no other rival can. Porsche has rejuvenated its large luxury KN SUV in this third generation, guys. The styling represents a mere gradual evolution, but the changes inside and beneath the skin are genuinely far-reaching. Is this still its segment's definitive sports SUV? We're going to find out. The 911 sports car may be the model Porsche is known for, but it's the KN large luxury SUV which has made the brand the world's most profitable car maker. This has been the model that's really established a company in this modern era, achieving over 770,000 global sales by the time of this Mark III model's launch in early 2018. For some time in the early part of this century, uh, the KN was the brand's best seller, and indeed, for much of this millennium, this SUV has outsold all of Porsche's other models put together. Now that won't be the case with this third generation version because it's now positioned above a smaller and slightly more affordable Porsche SUV model, the Macan. That has meant a need for this KN to fulfill a slightly different role in the company's lineup. Whereas once Porsche would talk about this model being a family sports car, a five seat 911 and so on, that mantle now sits more comfortably with the Macan. The KN these days now has more in common with the brand's Gran Turismo, the Panamera. It shares much of that executive contenders engineering, including its new tech active anti-roll bar setup, its rear axle steering system, and its three-chamber air suspension, all of it coordinated by Porsche's freshly developed 4D chassis control central network system. You sense that all of this technology is certainly going to be needed if a genuinely sporting conveyance is to be made out of something this big and heavy. And it's an objective that will be further aided by this Mark III model's adoption of a shorter version of the high-tech MLB Evo platform that it shares with Bentley, Audi and Lamborghini. Under the bonnet, there's a range of completely new V6 and V8 engines, all of them mated to a new 8-speed PDK auto gearbox. Plus, there's cutting-edge hybrid plug-in technology that from launch was designed to completely replace the need for diesel power. Add in a vast improvement in media connectivity and a completely redesigned interior that claims to set fresh class standards. And there's certainly the potential for this to be the most sophisticated SUV that Porsche has ever made. Time to test it. Why the KN represents such a benchmark when it comes to dynamic handling and a large, powerful SUV is something other brands have continually tried to analyze. Any 4x4 of this sort can go plenty fast enough in a straight line if you give it a big enough engine, but it'll generally struggle to carry speed through the bends in the way that a lower, lighter car would, which is why huge, potent SUVs are generally so uncomfortable to drive quickly, with staccato progress constantly marked by violently shifting Heading speed, then rapidly recovering it. The KN has never been affected by this trait quite so much as rival models, and this third generation version suffers from it even less. When you're pushing on through the turns, it's able to seek out grip and traction that you'd think a car of this sort simply wouldn't be able to find and deliver it with the kind of poised body control that you'd normally expect would be foreign to a 2.2 ton SUV. And it's all further embellished by Porsche's experience in steering feedback that's delivered through this grippy 918 Spider supercar derived wheel. A well engineered conventional sports estate would still reward you more. Uh, the laws of physics have to tell somewhere, although by spending extra on dynamic gadgetry with this third generation model, you can mitigate them to a surprising extent. 
much of this kit, uh, things like the three chamber air suspension system, the active anti-roll bars and the rear axle steering is shared with the Volkswagen Group large SUVs that also use this Mark III Model KN's more sophisticated MLB Evo platform. As a result, some might easily jump to the lazy conclusion that this is simply a Zuffenhausen branded version of the premium SUV engineering package, which has already brought us the most recent versions of the Volkswagen Touareg and the Audi Q7, plus the Audi Q8, uh, the Bentley Bentayga and the Lamborghini Urus. The truth is a little more complex than that. For sure, this Porsche shares much with its cousins, but there are also key differences. It's the only one of them that uses the MLB chassis in a significantly shortened form, and the KN has its own bespoke clutch-based four-wheel drive system that can send more torque rearwards more of the time. There'll certainly be plenty of that, regardless of which option you select from the much improved and now completely petrol-powered engine range. There's a 3.0-litre V6 used in both the base model and the e-hybrid, a 2.9-litre twin-turbo V6 for the KNS and a 4.0-litre twin-turbo V8 for the potent turbo version that we're trying today. The handling of all these variants is further aided by the marginal weight saving that the engineers have been able to deliver this time around and of course by that track developed steering rack. The result of all this ought to deliver the VW conglomerate's most driver focused large SUV and it does. Mind you, as we referenced earlier, to get the most from it, a fair bit of option box ticking will be required, or at least that's what your Porsche salesperson will tell you anyway. Uh, we're not quite so sure. The technology we referenced earlier is hugely impressive, but should you be buying this car, don't feel like you have to have it. If you're looking at one of the mainstream variants, a standard spec model with steel springs and the minimum of dynamic gadgetry, that might in some ways actually feel more involving and communicative. It really depends on the kind of experience that you're looking for. Uh, we'd really advise you to try differently specified variants with different dynamic options, as you can, for instance, at the Porsche Center at Silverstone, and then decide from there. If, as a KN customer, you are setting out on a quest to make this car even more dynamically able, a good starting point would be to choose a package of technology dedicated towards shedding even more body roll through the bends. Uh, that is the purpose of the PDCC, the Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control Adaptive Anti-Roll Bar Setup. Now, PDCC was offered by the previous generation model, but here the old electro-hydraulic system has been swapped for a faster reacting 48 volt electromechanical one that can now suppress lateral inclination in milliseconds, keeping the body stable to a quite eerie degree when you're pressing on through tighter turns. Uh, with the KNS and this V8 turbo variant, uh, you can add in PTV Plus, Porsche Torque Vectoring Plus, and that quells understeer and wheel spin through tight corners and also locks the differential for extra traction when you're accelerating out of a bend. Even more accurate cornering agility can be delivered by the rear axle steering system that at higher speeds sees the rear wheels steer slightly in the same direction as those at the front and as a bonus at under 31 miles an hour the same setup moves the rear wheels in the opposite direction from the fronts to aid awkward manoeuvring. If budget permits, you'll want the ideal suspension setup too. PASM adaptive damping is included on all but the entry of a model, and even then, virtually everyone specifies it. But most KM customers go further and add in the optional air suspended system that we're trying here, and that's a standard feature with the V8 variants. Uh, this three chamber setup has this time around been considerably improved with a far wider set of spring rates, and that's something that you can directly experience with the provided high, medium, and low tarmac orientated chassis height options. Now you're likely to be heavily persuaded towards specifying the air suspension setup by your local Porsche center, but it's worth going along with it because the system really does enable you to change the character of this car over this KN's uh, three available chassis driving modes, cosseting in normal but firmly purposeful if you go for sport or sport plus. 
As usual with these kinds of systems, uh, these settings also influence steering feel, throttle response, uh, stability control settings, and the shift timings of the eight-speed automatic gearbox. Uh, the transmission is one of the few engineering elements featuring here that uh, differ from what's used in Porsche's Panamera Gran Turismo five-door model. Uh, that car's dual-clutch PDK setup is replaced in the KN by a gutsier ZF torque converter auto that's better able to preserve this SUV impressive three and a half ton towing capability. Another feature that the vast majority of KN buyers go for is the Sport Chrono package that gives you launch control for F1 style getaways that'll take a couple of tenths off the acceleration sprint times that I'll be quoting later. As part of the deal, you also get a center dash stopwatch, but perhaps of greater importance is the addition of an extra interim sport setting for the stability system, which allows a controlled degree of cornering slip while still retaining an electronic safety net should your ambition and get the better of you. The rotary dial here on the steering wheel for selecting between the various chassis driving modes we just mentioned is embellished if you have the Sport Chrono package with an extra individual option which allows you to tailor the drive setup to suit your own personal preferences and with the central sport response button on the mode selection dial. Now press that and for 20 seconds you get a short-term blast of engine response which will be useful for tight overtaking maneuvers. All of the drive systems just mentioned now coordinate together with Porsche's freshly developed 4D chassis control central network system. And we ought to tell you a bit more about those V6 and V8 petrol engines we mentioned earlier. They're all capable of throwing this car up the road with some vigor. And that's especially if you opt for the Sport Chrono package we just mentioned, which via its launch control uh, shaves a couple of tenths off the acceleration sprint times I'm just about to give you. Now things kick off with a standard three litre V6 model, simply badged KN and offering 340 horsepower. Uh, rest to 62 uh, goes by in 6.2 seconds with a top speed of of 152 miles an hour. It's more likely though that you'll be considering the e-hybrid variant which achieves a total output of 462 horsepower by mating the same engine with a 136 HP electric motor that's able to deliver 31 miles of all-electric driving range and an all-electric top speed of 87 miles an hour. If you're something of an enthusiast for this model though, then you'll want to be considering one of the performance versions, possibly the KNS, which swaps the 3.6 litre V6 used by this variant in the previous generation lineup for an even more potent twin turbo 2.9 litre V6 from Volkswagen Group sports cars like the Audi RS5. Now that unit here puts out 440 HP and 550 newton metres of torque, and it thunders to 62 miles an hour in 5.2 two seconds on the way to 164 mph. To go even further, you'll need the V8 that features in this frantically fast 550 HP turbo model. Now this top engine is now a 4 litre unit and it's a bit less hourly charismatic than the 4.8 litre V8 used in the previous KN turbo, but it's usefully faster in the mid-range and as you can probably imagine, it's significantly more efficient. Porsche has even developed a faster S-branded models that use uh, this 3996cc engine with or without e-hybrid technology, but we can't really see why you'd ever want to exceed the prodigious speed that the standard V8 turbo can already offer. 62 mph flashes by in 4.1 seconds, and if you happen to commute to the office on a stretch of de-restricted autobahn, you can reach 177 miles an hour flat out. Whatever engine you choose, you're going to want to enjoy its aural fireworks, and to do that, you're going to need the optional sports exhaust system. Without it, the sound and fury from beneath the bonnet doesn't really fully make it into the cabin. Uh, what few previous KN owners have tended to do, though, is to upgrade the braking system. That's something that, uh, if you're going to be driving this car hard, you might think ought to be a bit of a priority, given the combination of horsepower and weight on offer here. The exorbitant cost of the piece CCB, the Porsche ceramic composite braking setup that we're trying here, understandably dissuaded customers in the past from switching away from the standard iron calipers. But there's now a much more affordable interim option, that for the PSCB, Porsche surface coated brakes, which feature a coating of tungsten carbide, uh, which increases stopping power and which come as standard on this turbo model. 
What else? Um, well, we haven't said a lot about the four-wheel drive system, um, except to point out that it's been fully optimized for tarmac use. That doesn't mean, though, that this car can't still offer surprising levels of off-piste prowess. Quite a lot's actually provided here for the kind of off-road driving that will be uh, foreign to almost all KN buyers, but which they'll like the thought of being able to attempt. There's no low-range gearbox, of course. Don't laugh, you could have one on the original Mark I model, but four off-road driving modes are provided, uh, gravel, mud, sand, and rock. Unfortunately, though, you don't get the, uh, the auto-style setting, which is available on a rival Range Rover, and even on the Volkswagen Touareg to make all the terrain decisions for you. Now, the modes you do get work with PTM, Porsche Traction Management, to change gearing, throttle response, and if you've specified air suspension, uh, that's something that will dramatically improve this car's mud plugging prowess, ride height too. Now the result is a remarkably impressive set of off-roading stats. Air suspension means the 190mm ground clearance of an ordinary steel springed KN can be increased to as much as 245mm in that top terrain setting, and the maximum wading depth increases by 25mm to 525mm. You can achieve a slope angle of up to 27.1 degrees and a ramp breakover angle of up to 21.1 degrees. If somewhat unwisely you're minded to put these stats to the test, uh, then you'll be grateful for the Porsche Hill Control System that eases you down slippery slopes and you'll want a KN that's been specified with the optional off-road package. Now that's offered on all variants except the e-hybrid and includes various add parts to protect vital vehicle components during tough off-road driving. As part of that pack, you additionally get extra off-road specific information on the center dash PCM screen and a compass display on the fascia. But as we've already suggested, none of this will be of much interest to a typical KN buyer. Uh, there'll be someone who'll be far more attracted by this Porsche's electronic technology, maybe the PDLS Plus Matrix headlights, which adapt not only to the surrounding traffic, but also to the weather and the topography of the road. And they feature a wider reach too for high-speed highway use. And there's also the way that this KN can, to some extent, drive itself if you specify the clever Porsche inner drive system which includes adaptive cruise control. Once you've set a navigation destination, InnerDrive will constantly look ahead over the next couple of miles and calculate the optimum acceleration and braking responses that you're going to need and take into account corners and roundabouts, inclines, speed limits and traffic flow. It then feeds all this information to the gearbox, the engine and the braking system. It's all satisfyingly sophisticated but ultimately it's good to know that technology doesn't define this car to quite the same extent that you will find elsewhere in this segment. This is a Porsche after all, and thank goodness, it really feels like it. These days, this third generation KN is quite a smart looking thing, but in the past, this car rarely has been. Uh, the earliest models attempt to graft a Porsche 911 front end onto Volkswagen Touareg underpinnings never sounded like a good idea, and it wasn't. Since then, to be frank, Porsche has struggled with the task of integrating all-terrain toughness with its brand's trademark sports car style. Still, the second generation KN showed the possibilities here, and this longer, lower Mark III version takes its lead from the company's smaller Macan SUV in perfecting the possibilities of this design. From the front, there's no longer the feeling that Porsche is rather awkwardly trying to graft 911 styling cues into a boxy crossover silhouette, and the previously rather bluff frontage has been somewhat softened by a long sweeping bonnet. This features a more distinctive power dome, and that helps to emphasize the sleeker wings. And these flow into LED headlights that feature three-dimensional light modules and the usual four-beam arrangement favored by the brand. These headlamps can now be optionally ordered with the LED matrix technology that we've been trying here, and that sees 84 piercing LEDs continually adapting themselves to the surrounding vehicles and current road conditions. That's based on current driving and navigation data. Now another key change and a differentiation point from the Macan is the way that this central air intake now flows seamlessly into these black framed corner sections and these sit above narrower lower cutout strips that are indented into the sleeker bumper. 
Uh, the introduction of that smaller SUV model has allowed the Cayenne to grow a little to a fraction under five meters in length. Uh, it's 63 millimeters longer and only just under two meters wide, creating a substantial roadway footprint that's now very similar to that of the rival Range Rover Sport. In profile, you have a better perspective for the slightly lower rear roof line and the narrower side windows, both elements there to make the vehicle appear lower to the ground and more streamlined. And these redesigned rear wings create a more powerful set of haunches and they visually urge the car forward. This higher set lower crease separates arches that shroud slightly larger wheels this time around. Uh, the sizes vary between 19 and 22 inches. We've got the dark titanium 21 inch rims here and they're complete with the yellow calipers of the optional PCCB Porsche ceramic composite brake system. Mixed tyre sizes, front and rear, are fitted to the first time on a KN and they're to boost the drive towards sharper driving dynamics. It's at the back though that the biggest changes have been made to this third generation KN with sleeker treatment that makes previous models look very utilitarian indeed. Now it's all down to this ribbon of rear light that separates the smarter three-dimensional LED rear lamp clusters. Now that's there, Porsche says, to better distribute the visual volume of the design and give the car a more lightweight demeanor. Uh, particular identifiers for this V8 turbo model include uh, distinctive twin tailpipes that sit in a more potent low diffuser and for the first time in the SUV segment, an adaptive electrically extended roof spoiler that uh, rather helpfully for the local constabulary activates at 100 miles an hour to increase stabilizing force on the rear axle and it can also act as an air brake during sharp deceleration. As usual, of course, uh, what matters more is the stuff that you can't see. Now, under the skin lies the same MRB Evo platform that this car shares with other Volkswagen Group large SUVs like Volkswagen's Touareg, Audi's Q7 and Q8 models, uh, Bentley's Bentayga and the Lamborghini Urus. Here, though, the chassis is a full 100 mil shorter to better meet with Porsche's priorities in making this car more agile and dynamic. And that's an objective that's further aided by a 65 kilo overall weight reduction this time around. And that is thanks to lighter weight steel and aluminium composite structure. Get yourself behind the wheel and if you've been familiar with older KNs, you might almost think you've skipped a generation here. So dramatic are the advances in cabin technology. Now we'll get to that. First though, uh, let's reference something that hasn't changed and that's a driving position that remains remarkably low set for a large SUV. That's in keeping with that quest for sports car style driving dynamics and a cockpit style feel. Now if you're buying this kind of car to get the usual lofty, commanding four by four perspective on the road ahead, then this one won't be for you. Porsche people though will continue to love the way that the cabin wraps itself around you, the same jet fighter style rising center console that you'll find in the 911. Your first fear for what the brand calls the digitalization of this cabin comes when a twist of the unusual starter control brings this shiny piano black center console around the gear stick rather startlingly into life with a range of touch sensitive icons that replace all the previous models fiddly little buttons. It certainly all looks much smarter but compared with the old arrangement it's much harder to find your target by touch plus the surface attracts uh, dust and smears. Just above lies the other defining feature of this cabin, the huge 12.3 inch color touchscreen that controls the now standard Porsche communication management infotainment system. Now initially its functionality can seem pretty daunting with all the media and connectivity menus joined by a drive section in which you have to choose your drive mode, your chassis setting and your chassis height, plus the settings for the sports exhaust and the active rear spoiler if they've been fitted. Fortunately, this monitor is an enormous improvement over the previous dated setup. It can sense the hand approaching it and display menus it thinks you're likely to want to view. Uh, using predefined tiles, users can easily create a home screen with their preferred functions and then quickly switch them around using the usual pinch and swipe technology, all the while enjoying crystal clear graphics that only Mercedes can match. It is annoying though that this setup doesn't come with a kind of um, separate controller 
by the gear stick that many rivals in this segment do provide. That's a problem if, like us, you struggle to get to grips with voice control. Various shortcut buttons ahead of the gear stick certainly help to more easily access the system's functionality, but once you've activated them, you often still have to stab away at the touchscreen to try to find what you want. It all means that in driving this KN and using its features, you can often find yourself taking your eyes from the road more often than might be ideal, either to access some of the rather small icons on this central screen or to find the switch on this lower black panel. Of course, that'll probably be less of an issue once you're more familiar with the car. Apple CarPlay smartphone mirroring is provided, although not Android Auto. Plus, there's most of the media connectivity that you could want for things like uh, weather readouts, plus a wide range of compatible apps, including one designed by Porsche that, amongst other things, allows you to send and receive journey destinations. Unless you've paid extra for a head-up display, all the key driving data that always needs to be in your line of sight has to be housed in this wide instrument binnacle. Now, at first glance, this seems to deliver the classic five-dial display, which characterised some of Porsche's iconic previous models. But closer inspection reveals that the only actual conventional gauge on offer here is the central rev counter. This is surrounded by seven-inch sized virtual screens on either side that can be configured to represent the extra dials and which which are activated by rotary controllers on the steering wheel. Uh, the speed and assist display on the left, which is flanked by a temperature gauge, doesn't tell you much that's really vital apart from how fast you're going. But with the car and info screen on the right, there's considerably more to see. Uh, scrolling through the options allows you to view trip computer readouts, along with tyre pressure, all-wheel drive system, and even G-force readings, all shown alongside an analog clock. Uh, there's also a navigation option with mapping that takes up the whole of the right-hand section of the binnacle. What else? Um, well, the classic three-spoke wheel feels great in your hands and the uh, sports seats are brilliantly supportive, especially the 18-way adjustable turbo spec chairs that are fitted here. They're also well positioned to allow for pretty good all-round visibility, thanks to the fact that the A-pillars aren't too thick and the side windows are big. True, the rear screen pillars are fairly chunky, but of course, parking sensors are standard and most owners will probably tick the box for the expensive rear view camera too. Uh, choose the sport chrono option, you get this lovely dash top mounted stopwatch that uh, also duplicates its functionality onto the center dash screen. And that's where you'll get a particularly useful lapse available on current fuel readout. As for cabin problems, well, they're restricted to minor niggles. This cheap feeling drive mode controller dial on the steering wheel, for example, which simply doesn't fit with cabin quality that otherwise easily justifies a six figure sum. Now we'd complete the effect with the optional ambient lighting package and that bathes the cabin in a choice of colors, warm or cold white, lemon green, Atlantis or topaz blue, poppy red or dark orange. What else? Um, well, that screen can be slow to find data and cabin storage could be better too, with no upper compartment for your sunglasses, no ticket clips on the sun visors, plus the cubby that you're most likely to use for your phone, this compartment here, just below the gear lever, hasn't been shaped to hold your handset securely, so this is gonna be thrown around whenever you turn a corner. Uh, premium segment etiquette, which usually insists on a lid for this twin cup holder between the seats, has been ignored, but this area does include 12 volt port. Elsewhere, um, the deep door pockets can accommodate 1.5 litre bottles and they offer 3.9 litres of space. The 7.8 litre glove box is reasonably sized and it has a pen clip on its leading edge. And further back, there's a shallow storage box covered by an armrest which incorporates twin USB ports and an optional phone charging mat. Let's try the back. Now the slight reduction in roof height this time around isn't enough to in any way impede entry or to cause any issues with headspace. Now Porsche has lowered the seating position a bit to compensate for the sleeker roof line. As you can see, the immaculately trimmed ceiling is certainly enough to permit for the fitment of the redesigned optional panoramic glass roof, should you want that. Uh, there is no wheelbase increase this time around, so there's no real increase in legroom, but the scalloped front seat backs help and you can better prioritize space for your feet by making use of seat bases that slide over 
over a range of 160 millimeters across the 60-40 split. Uh, the seat backs recline in 10 stages in two degree increments from 11 to 29 degrees uh, for greater comfort on longer journeys. And the relatively low height of the center transmission tunnel means that three adults can be accommodated without too much discomfort for the occupant who's drawn the short straw and gets stuck in the middle. The side windows now feature standard heat insulating glass, which reduces heat buildup in the passenger compartment. And folk back here are also favored with seat back storage pouches, as well as deep pockets in these doors, which here feature excellently angled uh, ergonomic handles. And in this case, classy piano black trim and red stitching. A center armrest uh, provides extra cup holders and over the transmission tunnel, there's a lower compartment with 12 volt and USB ports just above. There are twin vents and if you've opted for the four zone climate control system we have here, separate digital temperature and fan controls for the back seats too. Finally, let's take a look in the boot, but let's pause on the way to remark on the fact that the increased body length this time around still hasn't caused Porsche to reconsider its decision not to offer buyers the option of fold-out third row seating of the sort that you can specify on a directly comparable BMW X5 or Range Rover Sport. Click the key fob button for the power operated tailgate, that's standard, and it's now optionally operable by foot gesture, and you'll find that all models offer significantly more boot space than the previous generation model could provide. Uh, so with the base and S variants, there's 770 litres of capacity, that's 100 litres more than before. Uh, to give you some segment perspective, that's 125 litres more than you'll get in the rival BMW X5. Do bear in mind though that the capacity figure falls to 745 litres in this turbo model and further to 645 in the e-hybrid version. And that's thanks to the need to incorporate the batteries that drive the petrol electric system. Now annoyingly, Porsche still declines to offer a standard spare wheel, but that does free up a bit of extra underforce space, even if you've got the upgraded audio system that requires this extra subwoofer. It's a usefully square loading area, although to get to it, you'll have to lug your stuff over a chunky loading lip that's embellished with a stainless steel cover that'll scratch easily. Um, there's a netted storage area on the left-hand side, and there's a right-hand sidewall compartment. Uh, now, with the assistance of rear passengers, there is the option to vary the boot space on offer, thanks to the sliding rear bench, and also the way that you can make these seat backs more vertical. Now, if you have specified your KN with air suspension, then you'll find these controls on the right-hand cargo sidewall that allow you to select a lower load ride height, which is uh, 40 mils closer to the deck, so lumping in heavier stuff will be a lot easier. The controls for the optional electrically retracting tow bar also reside here. Uh, Porsche has forgotten to include a 12 volt socket, but there is a bag hook and there's also uh, the usual four chromed tie down points. If you need more space, your first option is to make use of the fact that the rear backrest has a 40-20-40 split, so freeing up the central part to flatten for the carriage of long items like skis without disturbing a couple of rear seat passengers is possible. Um, if that's not enough and you have to fold the rear bench, then there's the annoyance of not being able to do that from the back of the car. You have to go all the way around to the side door and uh, pull up these rather cheap feeling seat base catches. When everything is folded forward, there's an almost flat loading area that on the base or S specification KNs will be 1,710 litres in size. With this turbo model, there's 1,680 litres of space, while with the e-hybrid, the total is 1,610 litres. You might expect the entry-level price point for KN ownership to be higher than it actually is. Uh, you're talking around £56,000 for the 340 horsepower standard 3-litre petrol V6 model, which is simply badged KN. Don't get too excited though, once you've specified this car up in a form that you'll probably want, you'll be paying considerably more than that. Uh, so perhaps you might as well just start further up the range, stretch up to just over 67000 and you'll get yourself the 
plug in a hybrid variant which uses the same engine as the base version but mates it to a 136 horsepower electric motor creating so Porsche believes a more sensible alternative to the diesel engines that uh, all its competitors still offer well perhaps of course, there's much more power on offer than that if you really want it. A budget around 70,000 will get you the KNS, which uses the potent twin turbo 2.9 litre V6 that we've previously seen in sports cars like the Audi RS5, here developing 440 horsepower. Or if funds permit, you can still stretch to a V8 powered KN. This turbo model now using a four litre unit, putting out 550 horsepower and requiring a 100,000 pound budget. Pretty much all the engineering here is shared with the brand's Panamera Gran Turismo model, although a key difference is that this SUV replaces that car's PDK dual-clutch auto gearbox for the tougher torque converter auto transmission, which is necessary to preserve this 4x4 contender's prodigious towing capability. Family buyers might like to note that whatever version of this model is chosen, there's no possibility of the kind of seven-seat option that some rivals offer. Uh, On to the value proposition Zuffenhausen's asking figures represent. Now, in analysing rivals, logically, perhaps, the obvious place to start is with the Volkswagen Group models that share this car's MLB Evo platform and much of its engineering. Uh, now, a KN appeals to a rather different buying demographic to the Wolfsburg conglomerate's less dynamically orientated Volkswagen Touareg and Audi Q7 models. And anyway, the uh, engine lineup that you get with those two SUVs is based around the diesel powertrains that Porsche has uh, rejected this time around. So for reference, uh, base diesel versions of the Touareg and the Q7 would probably save you about £17,000 on the KNE hybrid variant that probably represents the most direct comparison. Now a more relevant rival and perhaps a closer cousin to this car is the sleeker and more fashionable, more driver orientated Audi Q8, which in 286 PS 50 TDI diesel form costs almost exactly the same as a comparable KNE hybrid. Outside of the Volkswagen group of brands, a wide choice of other options await. BMW X5 has traditionally been the rival that most closely replicates this Porsche's driver-orientated remit, and in its fourth generation, that model aims to continue to remain prominent on any potential KN buyer's shopping list. In X-Drive 40i petrol form with 340 horsepower, the BMW is directly targeted at a base KN, costing just a couple of thousand more. For around £70,000, that's the cost of a KN e-hybrid with a couple of well-chosen extras, you could have the X5 in desirable M50D 400 horsepower diesel guys. Uh, we also think you need to factor in the Range Rover Sport as a dynamically orientated rival amongst sporting large SUVs in this segment. So in its most popular SDV6 diesel form, that car costs only fractionally less than a KN e-hybrid, but it's got nothing like the same level of performance. Now you could say the same for a well-specified diesel-powered Maserati Levante. Now that Italian contender can be had with a V6 petrol engine and a power output similar to that of a KNE hybrid, but you'd need around 5,000 pounds more for it. Uh, the other large luxury SUVs in this segment, models like the Mercedes GLE, the Jeep Grand Cherokee and the Volvo XC90 aren't really relevant to our perspective here as they have more of a luxury remit than a sporting one. And the same applies to the Lexus RX, which is a hybrid but doesn't have the plug-in technology of this Porsche. For reference, all four of those cars can be had with a kind of sporty trim that might appeal to a potential KN buyer and in such guises they'll require a budget somewhere in the 50 to 60,000 pound bracket. It is arguably more meaningful to talk about the segments to large luxury SUV coupes, BMW X6 and the Mercedes GLE coupe, although neither would give you this KN's practicality or its off road ability. But anyway, for reference, uh, if you were using a KN e hybrid as your benchmark, well, the X6 X Drive 40D diesel model that you'd need for comparable performance uh, would cost you only around £3,000 less. A Mercedes GLE Coupe 350D diesel, that wouldn't give you comparable performance, but it's still priced within £3,000 of a hybrid KN. 
If having considered all the alternatives that you decide it is a KN that you really want, well, then you're gonna to need to know just how generous Porsche has been with the standard specification. Now, we have mixed feelings here. Is it really justifiable on a car of this price to make buyers pay extra for features like metallic paint, roof rails, keyless entry, heated seats, and a reversing camera? Well, we think not. Having said that though, it's also true that entry-level KN models are a lot better equipped than they used to be. Uh, in addition to model-specific features like the PDK automatic gearbox and the active all-wheel drive system, uh, the kit list runs to alloy wheels of at least 19 inches in size, uh, automatic full LED headlamps, an electrically powered tailgate, LED tail lamp clusters, tinted heat insulating glass and rain-sensitive wipers. Uh, inside there are part leather trimmed seats, plus you get dual zone climate control with pollen and carbon filters and cruise control with a speed limiter. Uh, while in addition, the interior mirror, like the exterior ones, has auto dimming functionality. Uh, the multifunction steering wheel has buttons which activate the Porsche communication management infotainment setup. And that's a 12.3 inch screen and it comes complete with navigation, voice control, internet capability, Bluetooth phone connectivity, and a 10 speaker, 150 watt DAB audio system. Uh, there is standard Apple CarPlay smartphone mirroring, although not Android Auto, and also an included Connect Plus module with LTE and 4G phone connectivity, Wi-Fi capability, and an integrated SIM card. You get some really clever connectivity technology too. Uh, there are Car Finder and Porsche Vehicle Tracking System Plus services, which let you know where your KN is at all times. And there's a downloadable Porsche Connect app for Apple and Android phones, which gives you a wide variety of digital features and services, including a remote vehicle status feature via which you'll be able to check vital data like uh, door locking and fuel range from your phone. The navigation system is able to process so-called swarm data via its risk radar service, and that anonymously captures data about traffic and road conditions from vehicles which have relevant equipment. Now that could mean that uh, your KN will know in advance about fog, skidding risks, and road accidents, and it will adapt its systems and navigational inputs accordingly. There are also 20 further apps available for this car. Uh, we like the Finder app, which allows you to find destinations of almost any kind in seconds. Uh, a covered car park rather than an open one, for example, if it's pouring down and you don't want to step out into the rain. Uh, then there's the Off-Road Precision app, which provides you with helpful tips for driving off-road. So that's talked you through the standard specification on the mainstream models. As you'd expect, given its six-figure asking price, this turbo variant adds a fair bit more and we'll touch on some of its extra features as we guide you through the extensive options list available for this model line. Now, you're certainly going to need to delve deep into that to create a KN that's properly able to showcase what's really possible from this third-generation design. Now, in our view, the key extras are the dynamically orientated ones. Most will want to enjoy the adaptive air suspension, which is optional on all but this top turbo variant, which gets as a standard. The system includes adaptive damping, which you can also get with the normal steel springs if your KN comes fitted with the brand's excellent PASM, that's Porsche Active Suspension Management System. It's optional on the base variant, but it's standard elsewhere in the range. Now, this setup offers normal, sport and sport plus chassis settings to vary the ride from cosseting to clinically precise. The other optional dynamic extra that most customers tend to add is the sport chrono package that we've been trying here. Now this gives you launch control for F1 style getaways, a dash top stopwatch and a steering wheel mounted mode switch for the uh, various driving settings. In the center of which is a sport response button that gives you a short term blast of engine response which will be really useful in tight overtaking maneuvers. 
Going further means adding the PDCC package. That's the Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control Sport Adaptive Anti-Roll Bar System, which dramatically limits cornering body roll. You might also want the clever rear axle steering setup, which at higher speeds uh, sees the rear wheels steer slightly in the same direction as those at the front, while at lower parking level speeds, they steer in the opposite direction. The result is extra cornering agility at speed and easier maneuvering when you're parking. KNS and KN Turbo buyers can also specify PTV Plus. That's the Porsche Torque Vectoring Plus package that works uh, through the twisty stuff to counter both understeer and wheel spin by lightly micro braking whichever front wheel is threatening to lose grip. PTV Plus also delivers a perceptible gain in traction when you're accelerating out of tight bends by locking the differential. Now, all of the systems I just mentioned now coordinate together with Porsche's high-tech 4D chassis control central network system. What else? Um, well, we definitely want the sports exhaust system, which perhaps appropriately you can't have on the e-hybrid variant. And if you're going to be using this car hard and fast, maybe even occasionally on a track, it might also be an idea to upgrade this model stopping power. Now, fearsomely expensive PCCB, Porsche ceramic composite brakes are as usual offered, but in our view, a better option is a slightly more affordably priced upgrade to PSCB, Porsche surface coated brakes, which come as standard on this turbo model. Now they still deliver fade free stopping power every time. Also worth considering is the Power Steering Plus package. Now that makes the steering firmer and more accurate at higher speeds, but at low speeds, it adjusts its ratio for easy maneuvering and parking. Um, in the unlikely event that you're gonna be regularly taking your KN off the beaten track, then you'll want to specify the optional off-road package. Now that is offered on all variants bar the e-hybrid, and it includes various add parts to protect vital vehicle components during tough off-road driving. As part of that pack, you additionally get extra off-road specific information on the center dash PCM display and a compass display too on the fascia. That last feature is also available separately. So what about headlight technology? Well, lower down the range, you can add in the PDLS Porsche dynamic light system that this turbo model includes as standard and the beams are able to turn with the bends. Here though, we've been trying the even more advanced PDLS Plus headlight package and that adds intelligent matrix beam technology with each LED lamp cluster containing a total of 84 LEDs that automatically adapt themselves to other road users and the road conditions. Now they draw from navigation data, as does another tempting electronic option, the brilliantly clever Porsche InnoDrive system, which includes adaptive cruise control. So once you've set a navigation destination, the InnoDrive system constantly looks ahead over the next couple of miles, calculating the optimum acceleration and braking responses that'll be needed, uh, taking into account corners and roundabouts, also inclines, speed limits, and traffic flow. It then feeds this information to the gearbox, the engine, and the braking system. Porsche claims that no other brand offers as sophisticated a setup. An ordinary adaptive cruise control setup is also available. That's there to automatically keep you a safe distance behind the vehicle in front on the highway. And you can also add in other features that'll make your journeying life easier, uh, like a head-up display, a reversing camera, and night vision assist, which uses a thermal imaging camera to register infrared radiation emitted by people or animals, displaying them on the instrument binnacle screen. Um, away from driving features are, of course, also lots of more comfort orientated options you could add. Uh, now this particular KN has the more comprehensive four zone climate control system. And that's an option that gives you a center mounted color touch screen for backseat passengers. Other extras on this particular car include a cabin air ionizer, soft closed doors and colored ambient lighting. There's also privacy glass and that can be specified with or without thermal noise insulation. Uh, some owners might want to look at a comfort access package which provides keyless opening and entry as well as the option of unlocking and opening the tailgate by merely waving your foot under the rear bumper. 
You might also want to look at electric steering column adjustment and a heated steering wheel. On the mainstream variants, you can pay extra for the package, which as standard on this turbo variant, gives you auto dimming interior and exterior mirrors, plus a rimless interior mirror. And you can add in a huge panoramic glass roof with an opening front section. Family buyers might also like the idea of powered rear side window sun blinds. Um, you'll want to think about front seat specification too. There's a package with 14-way electric adjustment and memory settings, or on the mainstream KN models, you can pay extra to add in this Turbo model's standard sports seats with their integrated headrests and 18-way adjustment. The seat heating you get front and rear on this Turbo variant can be optionally added in on the lesser models, and all KN variants can be specified at extra cost with cooling front and rear seat ventilation and a front massage system. As for seat trimming, well, full leather upholstery costs extra on most models, although it is standard on pricier variants like this turbo derivative. There is a Ritzia club leather upholstery package which is available on request. Don't forget to leave yourself some budget for upgraded infotainment too. To be frank, the standard 150 watt audio system isn't that special, so you're probably gonna to want to. Now the first step up from that standard setup is a 14 speaker, 710 watt Bose surround sound setup that comes as standard on turbo models like this one and uses noise compensation technology to ensure superb clarity. Or you could go all the way with the Burmester high-end 3D surround sound system with 21 speakers, 1400 155 watts of power and a sound enhancer to make sure you enjoy the full concert experience. Whatever your audio selection, a, an optional six disc CD DVD auto changer can as usual be added in and Porsche offers a seven gigabyte data pack that covers you for the use of Amazon Music Streaming, uh, for online radio and for surfing the web using the Wi-Fi hotspot in the car. For those sitting in the back, the Porsche rear seat entertainment pack provides two 10 inch touchscreen that work with a pair of provided Bluetooth headphones and which can be used to watch DVDs and video through the car's internet connection. Plus, they're equipped with a camera so boardroom folk can engage in video calling on the move. As for options, well, the majority of these concern interior and exterior aesthetics. Now, unless you want your uh, car finished in either solid white or black, you're gonna have to pay extra for the paintwork. There are a range of metallic options and a series of further special colors. Plus, the Porsche exclusive program can match any bespoke shade you might want to nominate at a cost. Uh, as you'd expect, there's a wide range of optional wheel rim choices with 19, 20, 21, and 22 inch rims some with colored finishes, and you can have color-coded centers. This turbo variant gets dark titanium trimmed, 21 inch rims as standard. Uh, it's possible to have the exhaust tailpipes finished in silver or black. And if you've gone for one of the PDLS headlight packages we were talking about earlier, you can have the lamps with a tinted finish. You can tint the LED tail lamps and their connected light strip too. You might also want to look at the Sport Design Package, which includes a more prominent front apron with C-blades around the intakes, plus a rear finisher and diffuser, side skirts, and a number plate surround in the same shade as the rest of the exterior. Now that revised Sport Design front apron can be ordered separately and you can trim the door mirrors in body color uh, in sport design carbon fiber or with a high gloss black finish that can also be applied to the door handles. Uh, there's also a high gloss black exterior package which we've got here which adds that finish to the side window trims and the front air intake slats. What if you're looking at making the cabin of your KN more bespoke? Well, if budget permits, you can really go to town. Uh, there's a wide range of colors available for the upholstery hide. We've got uh, black Bordeaux red two-tone leather interior fitted here. Uh, now you can embellish that with contrast seat stitching or have the front center seat panels in a contrasting color. There are various uh, interior trim inlay packages in natural olive gray, anthracite chestnut, dark walnut, carbon or textured aluminum. The front center console armrest can be embossed with the model logo or with the Porsche crest. And that can on request also be added onto the front and rear seats and onto the headrests. Uh, the steering wheel can be trimmed in Alcantara, carbon, anthracite chestnut or dark walnut. And the lovely Alcantara roof lining which is standard on this turbo model would mind a nice addition to the lesser variants. Uh, Personalised leather-edged floor mats are available, some with deep pile trim. 
plus there are packages that trim the door sill guards in either aluminium or carbon and illuminate them. Uh, you can opt to have the safety belts finished in various different colours. The face of the Centre Dash Sport Chrono stopwatch can be finished in red, white or beige and you can even get your vehicle key painted in body colour. On to practicalities. Well, many owners are going to want the electrically retracting tow bar that we have here, and we think it'd be wise to specify the 20 inch folding emergency tyre and possibly also a fire extinguisher. Now, you're probably going to want roof rails, and they can be finished in aluminium, black aluminium, or as here in high gloss black. Plus, they can be supplied either with or without roof transport system rails for the addition of things like roof boxes or carriers for cycles, snowboards, or skis. For the boot, we'd want the personalised leather-edged reversible luggage compartment mat and the optional rail system that uses straps or telescopic rods to secure the load. Finally, the conventionally engined models can be specified with an optional auxiliary heating system. Uh, the e-hybrid gets its own standard parking pre-climatisation setup. On to safety. Now, given the sophistication of the interior, we'd expected all manner of camera-driven safety tech to be available on this car. In the event, Porsche has limited itself to a fairly standard roster of features. There is autonomous braking, of course. Porsche calls its system Warn and Brake Assist. And as setups of this kind tend to do, this one scans the road ahead as you drive in search of potential accident hazards. If one's detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or perhaps you aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident and if necessary, perform an emergency stop. There's also lane keeping assist that warns you if you're drifting out of your lane on the highway and will subtly apply steering assistance to ease the car back to where it ought to be. And traffic sign recognition, which will picture the road signs you pass and display them on the dash. Uh, there's also lane change assist with turn assist. Now that's basically a blind spot monitoring package which uses radar sensors to monitor areas to the rear of the vehicle and the blind spots on either side of it. Now this system works between 10 and 155 miles an hour. It detects vehicles up to a distance of 70 meters and it'll warn you if you're about to pull out to overtake in front of another motorist, either in low speed turns or on the highway. Of course, all the more conventional stuff is also well covered. Every KN features the POSIP, Porsche Side Impact Protection System, which builds in side impact protection elements into the doors and includes thorax airbags integrated onto the side bolster of each front seat. There are also twin front side and curtain airbags, plus a knee bag for the driver. Further rear side bags are optional. Both outer rear chairs have isofix mounts and you can add another at extra cost for the front seat. All models of course feature ABS anti-lock brakes, PTM, Porsche traction management traction control, uh, tyre pressure monitoring and an active bonnet which will reduce pedestrian injuries if you hit someone. Uh, there's also PHC, Porsche hill control to ease you down slippery slopes. Prior to the turn of the century arrival of the original KN and before it BMW's X5, the only thing that was green about large plush SUVs was the colour they turned their passengers when hustled along twisty country roads. These days things are somewhat different, although you shouldn't get your hopes up too high in that regard. Take a look at the stats for the now exclusively petrol powered KN model lineup and you'll find that the V8 turbo variant that we're trying here returns an NEDC quoted best possible 24.1 mpg reading on the combined cycle and up to 267 grams per kilometer of CO2. You'll only do fractionally better than that if you go for either of the conventionally engined two V6 variants. Uh, the base 3 litre V6 standard KN model delivers up to 31.4 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 205 grams per kilometer, while for the 2.9 litre twin turbo V6 KNS, the respective figures are up to 30.7 mpg and up to 209 grams per kilometer. 
Rather bravely this time around, Porsche no longer offers us a Cayenne with diesel power in open defiance of rivals that all remain largely wedded to fueling from the black pump. Instead, the brand wants to point buyers to the version of this car that could well end up being the most popular variant in the range, the e-hybrid. Now, this derivative was a supporting player in the previous generation Cayenne model range, but there's every reason to suppose that it might now take a far more significant sales role for this model line. The general argument advanced against petrol-electric hybrid engines by the diesel lobby is that they produce significantly less mid-range pulling power, but that's not really true anymore. The Cayenne e-hybrid's combination of a 3 litre V6 and a 136 horsepower electric motor develops 550 newton metres of grunt, which, to give you some perspective, is only 70 newton metres less than you get from a rival Audi Q850 TDI, a car with almost half the total power output of this electrified Porsche. Whether such a rival diesel would be cheaper to run than a petrol-electric KN is, as ever, something of a moot point. As usual with plug-in models of this sort, the NEDC figures certainly suggest that. They claim up to 88.3 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 72 grams per kilometre of CO2 to be possible from the KN e-hybrid. Now you're probably thinking that those kinds of readings could never actually be achieved in real world motoring and you would be right. But even if what's actually achieved is way off those official stats, it's still likely to be better than what you get from a comparable diesel rival, which of course would be running on pricier black pump fuel. Again, for reference, uh, the rival Audi Q850 TDI we just mentioned returns 41.5 mpg on the combined cycle and 178 grams per kilometre of CO2. Too. And by the way, when we tested that car and drove it normally, we didn't get anywhere close to those readings either. On the subject of official readings that you won't be able to replicate, it's equally unlikely in uh, real life motoring that you'd ever manage to match the KNE Hybrid's NEDC quoted theoretical 27 mile maximum all electric driving range. To be fair, Porsche does quote this as an upper limit, also referencing the fact that the actual journeying range when the battery is fully charged could be as low as 14 miles, depending on how you drive. I uh, reckon on that lower figure being much more accurate. All of this assumes, of course, that the car is fully charged up, uh, which of course it very often won't be. The 14.1 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery can be replenished in 7.8 hours from a 230 volt connection, or in 2.3 hours if an option 7.2 kilowatt onboard charger is fitted. The car's charge rate can be managed remotely via a Porsche Connect app. Whatever KN you decide on, there is at least the compensation of knowing that its efficiency stats will undoubtedly have taken a useful step forward as part of the changes made to this third generation design. A smarter use of materials has apparently saved 135 kilos, although the actual curb weight has only fallen by 65 kilos this time around because weight has been added back in with extra equipment. As for the rest of the eco-minded engineering technology, well, uh, there's now a more sophisticated engine start stop system which works not only when the vehicle is stationary in traffic but also at the frequent near to stop speeds that characterize regular progress in urban motoring. Remember though that this feature will be automatically deactivated in the Sport and Sport Plus driving modes that you'll probably be most frequently using. All KN models achieve top speed in sixth gear, uh, the seventh and eighth gears are for cruising and they work with a coasting function which uh, at a cruise on the highway this connects the engine from the gearbox, sending the car into a sailing style mode until you brush your foot against the throttle again. On top of this, there are air curtains around the wheels that reduce efficiency sapping turbulence and active air intake flaps in the front grille, which stay shut when you fire the car up to help get it up to operating temperature as quickly as possible. At higher speeds, these vents then close to improve this Mark III Model KN's more aerodynamic profile. Um, other efficiency oriented engineering tech includes the way that with the KN S model's 2.9 litre V6 engine, the exhaust manifold is integrated into the cylinder head so it's surrounded by cooling water and that ensures that the combustion process is more efficient even under heavy throttle loads. 
Probably the initiative the Stuttgart maker is proudest of though is its Porsche Inner Drive system. That's an optional setup that works with adaptive cruise control using information from the sat nav plus radars and a video camera to assess the road ahead. It then feeds data to the gearbox, the engine and the braking system, modifying the car's behaviour for the terrain and the traffic conditions that it's going to come across, allowing it uh, to progress in the most efficient manner possible, braking earlier for corners, roundabouts and junctions for example. What else? Well, you won't have to pay the London congestion charge if you commute in a KNE hybrid, although only if you specify your car with the smaller 19-inch wheels. Um, across the KN range, servicing won't be especially affordable. Porsche workshop visits never are. Uh, so you'll want to know that maintenance intervals across the range are every 20,000 miles or two years, depending which comes soonest. A more significant dealer visit will be needed at four years or 40,000 miles. A minor service will probably cost around £450, while a major service will come in at around £600 or so. Tires and brake pads tend to be particularly expensive. Uh, surprisingly, the company hasn't copied other brands in offering a range of prepaid servicing packages at the point of purchase, but dealers do operate a fixed price servicing regime, so you'll always know exactly what work will be carried out and what it'll cost. In short, Insurance groupings won't be cheap. For standard e-hybrid or S-Spec KN variants, they're pitched at Group 45. Uh, for this V8 version, the turbo, it'll be Group 50. Included at point of purchase is the usual three-year warranty, although this one laudably doesn't come with any mileage limitations. Now this package can be extended by either one or two further years on request. Cayenne owners also get a three-year breakdown recovery package, a three-year paint warranty and a 12-year anti-corrosion guarantee. If you buy the hybrid model, then the battery pack comes with its own 60-month, 75,000-mile guarantee. Uh, and finally, let's touch on residual values. After a typical three-year, 36,000-mile ownership period, you can expect this car to return around 60% of its new price if you opt for a typical variant. Now, that's a decent showing for this segment, and it's about 5% better than you'd achieve with a rival Range Rover Sport. And finally, you can tell disapproving green-minded friends that 95% of this car is fully recyclable. Do KN owners have green-minded friends? Hmm, probably not. For some luxury SUV buyers, there's simply nothing else quite like a KN. This was the model that opened up Porsche ownership to a whole new group of people. They're not sports car purists, but they love the idea of sports car technology being applied to make a real luxury 4x4 appeal to real drivers. Certainly, it took the German brand some time to get this right. Early KNs were rightly forgettable, but this lighter, faster, greener, and better looking Mark III version is hugely impressive. In many ways, it's the most astonishing car of its kind we've yet driven. It's the KN Porsche always threatened it would build, a cutting edge benchmark in the luxury SUV segment with a redesigned cabin that makes the required six figure statement. In short, when we talk of this model being rejuvenated, we mean that in every sense. The technology on offer here is awesome, but if you like your driving, we're not sure that loading this car up with rear wheel steering, air suspension, and big wheels, as many owners will, is the best way towards showcasing its class leading status as the ultimate driving machine in the large part of the luxury SUV sector. However you specify this contender though, there's still nothing else quite like it in this class. Of course, we're not blind to things that you might not appreciate quite so much. Some still struggle with the styling, for example, although there's no doubt that the looks are now much easier on the eye. For others, uh, a factor of greater significance is the small but discernible shift towards more of a luxury demeanor this time around. But perhaps that's to be expected now that the brand has its smaller Macan model to do the whole SUV 911 thing. There is premium pricing too, of course, with figures that have risen again this time around, and that's something that would be easier to stomach had Porsche not been so mean with some aspects of the standard spec and consigned so many important features to the options list. 
But then a KN wouldn't be a KN without a touch of controversy. Ultimately, it's a magnificent thing, better than it ever needs to be, both on tarmac and perhaps more surprisingly, off it too. In almost every way that really matters, it's now a more credible contender. And if you want the quickest point-to-point -point performance SUV in this segment, nothing else in the class really gets close.